All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 235. Today, I have a special guest with me, and her name is Janet Allison, and she is the founder of Boys Alive. Welcome, Janet. It's great to have you here. So great to be here, Erin. So today, we're going to chat about boys, since that is a topic that both of us are passionate about. But before we get started, can you tell my listeners and viewers a little bit about what you do at Boys Alive? Well, I always have to say first that I raise daughters. I did not raise sons. And people Love wonder, it. what are you doing advocating for boys, which I have been doing for over 20 years now. But it started when I was a teacher in the mid 90s. And I had 10 boys and two girls in my first first grade class and was kind of shocked at the fact, more the fact that nowhere in my elementary ed training had anyone talked about boys and girls are going to be very different and learn differently and want different things from their lessons. And that really set me on this path of becoming an advocate for boys and helping parents and teachers understand what boys need. And that doesn't mean, of course, that we're not including girls, but I really feel like when we can understand our boys and advocate for them, it, it only helps our girls too. Absolutely. I think there's a, um, you know, I think every person has some feminine energy and some masculine energy inside of them. And I think our society and most societies in the world really uh, try to suppress that feminine energy in boys and try to suppress the masculine energy of girls. Sure. And it's very natural for all of us to have a little bit of both. We absolutely have, you know, and the ideal is to have a balance of both. But what's really happened pretty much since the Industrial Revolution when we decided that we needed to have education and classrooms set up the way they are a lot of auditory, a lot of sitting still. Mm -hmm. That is a very feminized view, feminized way of education. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work for mo most, not all, but most boys who their innate hardwired nature is to be learning as they're doing. And we've kind of shut that down. So we're seeing all these problems with problems, quote unquote, with our boys. But I feel like it is more the context that we've created around them. Mm -hmm. I know that when you and I were chatting a few days ago, I relate to a story with my sixth grade boy. And this is the first year he's not getting recess as he transitions to middle school. And a few years ago, they stopped having recess at our middle school. And recess at the middle school was just basically where the kids had to stand around outside. There's no playground equipment. There's no balls. They just mm -hmm. kind of, I guess, breathe some fresh air or something, but there's really not much to do. And so uh, it was kind of a waste of time, in my opinion, anyway. Mm -hmm. And so they got rid of it. And in its place, in that time slot, they put a focus period. So on one hand, it's a great place for kids to get their homework done, especially kids who have lots of uh, after school and evening activities. It's really great for them. Mm -hmm. But for the kids who need to move and burn off energy, going to yet one more classroom where they're made to sit still, don't talk, you can't be on the computer, you have to read or do your work, oh, that's just stretching it out and doesn't really give them a chance to move. Yeah. Sounds like torture session for a boy who needs to move his body. And some girls too have that real yes. um, innate need to be moving their bodies. And the thing about boys is when they are moving their bodies, they are actually more able to listen, more able to process information coming in. And, you know, they're, they're just better off. Their brains are on when their bodies are moving. And so we're actually really shutting them down by asking them to sit still mm -hmm. and not giving them opportunities to, 
move their bodies during the day. I had, I heard a story from someone I know who has adult children, boys, and she said one of her boys was struggling to learn his math facts. And she discovered that they had a little tiny uh, indoor trampoline, like a little, you know, it's, it's about a foot off the ground. Mm -hmm. And she discovered that if she quizzed him on his math facts while he was jumping on the trampoline, he could recall the answers lightning fast. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's where they practice the math facts every day on the trampoline. And I tell many parents, you know, if you want your boy to talk, replace your coffee table with a mini trampoline. And he will talk when he's in motion, but you don't have to have a mini trampoline, but you can, you can go, go for a walk, go out and shoot hoops or kick a ball around or wash dishes together or do something together. It's motion and activity for him. It also, the other thing it does is it takes the pressure off of him to make eye contact with you, which isn't very comfortable. And especially if you're talking about something emotional yes. and something tender, then take that, take that layer out, that extra barrier and be okay without the eye contact. You'll still be connected. He'll be even more connected to you without that need to, or the pressure to make eye contact. Mm -hmm. And it's but, kind of counterintuitive for us as women, because yes. we love the eye contact and we <laughs> get, you know, we get a hit of oxytocin, that feel good hormone. And we just, we love it. But when we recognize that many boys and many men do not prefer making eye contact, especially when it's something emotional, then, ah, we don't have to take it personally mm -hmm. as moms, as wives. Um, and we can recognize that um, it just, it's just not so comfortable. And I'm kind of chuckling inside because here we are on this podcast <laughs> and we've got our, you know, we've got our, our computer screens here and we're looking at each other. And yeah. I interviewed a man for, for my podcast last week and he did not look at me almost wow. the entire time. He was looking down, he was looking out the window. And if I didn't know this already, I would have been wondering, you know, what's wrong and what's wrong with me. And, and yet I knew. And so I adjusted myself and looked down more, looked away more and was able to calibrate to his comfort level. And that's what we have to know and learn as females to help our to help our boys and men be able to find their words and communicate with us such a good point one of the ways i found is useful in communicating with my 16 year old son is through text messaging mm -hmm. sometimes we have had really deep emotional discussions about something sensitive or vulnerable in his life over text messaging. Nice. nice. And it's amazing. The first time it kind of happened, you know, it wasn't intentional. It just, I just saw it unfolding and I thought, wow, this is, mm -hmm. this is really interesting. It's working. Yeah. And then once I realized it worked, whew, another tool in my pocket. That's right. To Keep help going. him. Nice. Nice. That's so sometimes nice. now I, will even wait to bring up something that I know might be a little sensitive for him. I'll even wait until he's not home. Nice. And then I'll just kind of like, you know, we should really cover blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk about it. And it's much easier than if he has to sit in the room with me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Bravo, mama. Great strategy. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and then the other thing that I found for my 11 year old who has been he and i have a really close relationship he's the baby of the family and we're we're very very close but he does not like to talk about intense emotional subjects he mm -hmm. just doesn't mm -hmm. and i normally i try to minimize how much we have to because i know it's just not comfortable for him but you know occasionally you have to have a discussion about something right 
and it was a funny story. My, uh, a friend of mine told me that she heard from her friend that my boy had a girlfriend. And I was like, uh, I didn't know anything about this. <laughs> then she said that I couldn't say who I heard it from because her son swore her to secrecy. Oh boy. Or else he would never tell him anything. So yeah. then I was going to put my daughter on his older sister. I was going to put her on detective duty to go find out what was going on so that I could officially know. And mm -hmm. then I said, she said, what do you want me to find out? And I said, your brother's got a girlfriend. She said, oh yeah, I know. And I was like, Whoa, what? <laughs> how did you know? And you didn't tell me. And she said, he swore me to secrecy. Mm -hmm. uh, so then uh, we had this, <laughs> I had this long conversation and by long, I mean, probably five minutes mm -hmm. where I tried to help him to understand that it's really not a big deal to talk about anything with me, even though it may right. feel like a big deal, but mm -hmm. that it's really important that sometimes we can have that whenever we need to, we can have these big conversations. Sure. sure. And so what I ended up doing a week or so later was taking him out for ice cream, just him and I. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought right. about that old saying, you know, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And when you're eating ice cream, you don't have to have intensive eye contact. And no. that, that story reminds me of another situation that we as women kind of put our boys and men into. And I was working with a mom, I'm a family coach, and she was concerned about her boy. They had moved across country and he was a middle schooler and she was very worried about him because he wasn't talking about the move and it wasn't expressing his feelings. And, you know, this must have been really hard to move across the country. And I, I asked her, well, you know, is he in school? How's school going? Is he making new friends? He's making new friends. Everything in this boy's world points to he's fine. He's fine. <laughs> he's fine, mama. And yet mom just wanted more. It was like, she, you know, she was just trying to pull out of him. There's got to be more feelings here, more depth of emotion. And to recognize that sometimes there's just not. Mm -hmm. and, and look for the outward signs. Is he doing okay? And then sometimes you just have to let it go and recognize that, you know, he, this topic ha has been fully covered and we're good. Even though mom, and of course, in this situation, the, uh, the, um, it was clear to me that mom needed some acknowledgement and some empathy about the difficulty of the move for her. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't so much about her boy. Her, her boy was fine. Mm -hmm. so, so there's that place where we come as women who love to talk about our feelings and process and process and process. <laughs> and our guys, not so much. Not, so not usually, <laughs> not usually. And then there's the place. It's such a balance because then you do want to be available when they do want to talk and yes. you have to kind of watch for the signs. And that's usually mm -hmm. around food. Make sure there's lots of food op eating opportunities. And a lot of times it's around bedtime mm -hmm. and to be there and be available at bedtime and this is a great tip for parents of teens, boys and girls who my daughters were in theater. So they were often out late at night. And of course, you know, you want to know when your kids come home. So I would go and lay on their bed and I'd read or I'd fall asleep or whatever, but they would come in at 11 or midnight and they were ready to talk. Because they're revved up, they've been, you know, they've been doing their thing and they're ready to talk. So being there and being available in that moment was was priceless. Mm. It's when they're ready to talk. It's not the next morning when they're groggy. groggy. Yeah, yeah. So a simple little adjustment that we can make as parents to be available when our teens especially are ready to talk in that moment. That's such a good point. I remember uh, m my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Shafali. She, sh her daughter is about nine months younger than my son. So we're kind of moving through the stages of adolescence close together with mm -hmm. them. 
and I remember her saying when her daughter was just approaching adolescence, she said, my daughter doesn't need me quite uh, the way she used to. In fact, she doesn't need me hardly at all, usually. So when they're little, they need our constant monitoring and supervision and they need us we just need to be in the room with them. We need to watch what they're doing, make sure they're safe, all this kind of stuff. As they get older, sometimes parents, I think, get lulled into a false idea that because they can tie their own shoes, cook their own food, hang up their own clothes, that suddenly they don't need us. And I really think that teenagers need us as much, if not more, than a toddler. I agree. Mm -hmm. And what she said back then stuck with me for always. And she said, my daughter may only need me 15 minutes a day now. She doesn't need me every waking minute. But mm -hmm. by golly, when she needs me, I better drop everything and be available to her. Mm -hmm. And then I'm available. She gets what she needs. And then she doesn't need me anymore. And then I can go back to what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's such good advice for parents of teens mm -hmm. boys or girls but i think probably it applies more to boys mm -hmm. because if we're speaking stereotypically of course this doesn't apply right. to all girls but sure most girls want to talk they want to tell you about their day and who said what and can you believe what she was wearing and oh i can't wait till the thing that's happening this weekend or whatever mm -hmm. but then the boys they don't care about all that they don't want to express it they don't want to talk about it in general yeah but boy, when they need us, we better, we better put our stuff aside and be available to listen. Well, and that, that is the listening piece. And, and it is really different with boys. So being, um, just being around the edges and being yeah. open and available to listen and watching for the subtle cues that tells you that, you're, that your boy is, is ready to talk. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be sure to touch on this other point and that is, um, many years ago, I was interviewing some older teens that had been through a rite of passage experience. And this was for parents to understand what the experience was. And, and so here's these 18, 19 year olds, <clears throat> excuse me, reflecting back on what it was like to be 12 and 14 and 16. And I said, what, what is the one thing that you wished that your parents had said to you then. And across the board, they all said, I wish that my parents had reassured me that I was going to be okay. Hmm. That had, you know, because when you're in that, in middle school, high school, things are crazy and you, your body, it feels like a runaway freight train and the social piece and everything. and. And for these kids, that idea of just having an adult reassure them, it's all going to be okay. It's a stage. You're going to move through this. Your body's changing. It won't always feel this way. Your friendships won't always be as up and down as this. And that there is, <laughs> there's light at the end of the tunnel. I think that is fabulous advice, and I'm so glad the boys shared it with you and that you shared it with the listeners because it is very true. Like you said, when our boys or our girls are going through something, they don't have the the benefit of the years of life experience that we do or the right. perspective, that long-term perspective. So it can feel like the end of the world if we were walking down the hallway and our friend didn't say hello to us. Like, this is it. The friendship is over. Oh my goodness. It's never going to be the same. And it, it's really not like that. So right. um, yeah. reassuring our kids, boys and girls, that this is going to pass. You're going to be fine. We're going to get through it. It's all going to work out. It's a wonderful, a wonderful message to share with our kids. Uh, so reassurance, I just think that's so important. And as you said, giving them the long view of mm -hmm. it isn't, you know, in this moment, of course, we want our kids to live in the present, but we have to reassure them that this too shall pass yes. and, and you're going to be okay. Yes. What yeah. a great message to end with today. 
Thank you so much, Janet, for coming on and chatting with me and reassuring parents of boys and girls that it is all going to be okay. And together we will work to get through it and help raise kids who feel good about themselves and are ready for facing the world. Yeah. All right. That wraps up today's episode. Wherever you are in this world, I hope that you make it a fabulous day for yourself.